Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest in interpreting. Thank you for your interest in communication. Thank you for your interest in uh, language. And thank you for your interest in the two topics that we are going to cover today, today which are active listening and public speaking. But we are not going to stick to active listening per se, or public speaking per se, because we are going to go beyond, beyond active listening and public speaking. So this is the structure of my talk, the welcome and introduction. And then we are going to see very briefly a framework that is being used in training and teaching people interpreting. Interpreting, I don't like to say skills, because the skills are only part of this framework. The framework is called LKSP framework. It is a framework that is used to empower novice interpreters and students of interpreting to uh, empower them in the market, in the, in the translation and interpreting market. And the third item is on good listening, active listening. A good interpreter is by definition a good listener. And we are going to investigate what does it mean listening in the, if everyday life and in particular situations like, the inter, like in interpreted events. And the other item on the agenda today has to do with public speaking. And a good interpreter is also by definition an excellent speaker. An excellent Excellent speaker. And we are going to see what are the characteristics of public speaking and the qualities of being an active speaker, uh, a public speaker. And then we are going to see some case studies, real examples of interpreted events. It, and some of them are personal uh, examples, and some of them are events or talks interpreted by my students. And we are going to, and some of them are present here, I think. We are going to take them as a case study, if they don't mind. But if they do mind, we are still going to <laughs> process them and investigate them. So introduction and the welcome. The context of the seminar. This seminar is part of a series of uh, lectures, workshops, and um, uh, workshops basically in interpreting general translation and audiovisual translation. But this time, the only difference is that this time, this classroom is open to the public, to uh, let's say, students or professionals from outside this course. The aim, it is not my aim to lecture. It is not my aim to preach on public speaking and active listening in interpreting, but uh, my objective, on the other hand, is to engage with you in a let's say, high-profile and fruitful discussion over these issues, over these issues. So the title, the title of this presentation or, or talk is An Interpreter is an Active Listener or as an Active Listener and a Public Speaker. So there are two sections here but there is an introductory section to the two sections on how to relate the public speaking skills and active listening skills to the job of interpreters. To the job of interpreters. And here I would like to say that interpreters uh, are not 
meant here the simultaneous interpreters in the booths, but any interpreter who is carrying out interpreting responsibilities, whether it is consecutive, chichotage, uh, or uh, escort interpreting. Because this, uh, the framework we are going to cover uh, in a moment applies to all interpreted events and to all uh, interpreting modes, all interpreting modes. So listening and, and speaking, L and S, these are very basic skills for humanity. We were born with these two skills, just to listen and to speak. We, and the reading ability or the reading skill and then the writing skill is a commodity, is not a basic commodity. It's something that came later. So this is an inherent skill in any human being. Just to be born, to listen to sounds, voices, and also to speak, to speak. So listening and speaking in interpreting. Listening, and, and as, as you might know, and I have covered this with my students, the interpreting process uh, involves three main phases. The first phase is the phase of the input, is the phase of understanding, is the phase of perception. And definitely this has to do with the source language text, or the source language discourse, or the source language utterances, and how we perceive them. And then the third phase or step has to do with speaking, producing. It is the production phase and production here is speaking. And there is another one in between which is the transfer or the conversion. Conversion that makes the interpreter converting one message from one language into another using memory, using memory. So here we are going to speak about memory also and how you need to have a successful memory management. Because in fact there is no one, there is no, there are in fact three memories and not just one memory. The long term memory, the immediate memory and the instant memory. And we are going to uh, highlight this later when we speak about knowledge in that framework. So here, you receive a message in one language, you try to perceive it. How are you going to perceive the message? With listening. Listening. And then, this, the third one, which is producing the same message in another language. How are you going to produce? Through speaking. Through speaking. Now, listening definitely helps you to sharpen your memory. And you make you, does make you attentive, more attentive. And speaking, definitely you need to learn how to speak to an audience more confidently and articulatory. Now, this is the framework we are going to use. It's the, K, the L KSP framework. It is a set of competencies. And the LKSP stands for language, knowledge, skills, and professionalism. Language, proficiency. Interpreters must have a solid and thorough command of all of their working languages. Some of the interpreters, they have five languages, working languages. Some of them have just two. Some of them have uh, three or four. So you have to have that uh, solid and thorough understanding. 
But also, you have to have an excellent active, means active for production, for speaking, uh, an excellent active command of their target languages. Because you know, the AIC, in the AIC, the uh, languages are classified according to a scale of language A, language B, language C, and some, are, some interpreters, they have two language, languages B. Two languages B, and perhaps one or two languages C. Means, and definitely language A is most of the time the mother tongue, most of the time, not always. Or the language of habitual use. Means you have an active, active command of, 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 of that language. You, need to, you can produce. You are very comfortable speaking that language. You are using it on a daily basis. On a daily basis, whether it is home, if it is your mother tongue, or in classrooms, if you are a teacher, for example, or you are living in a community that speaks that language. So it may be ranked as a language A. But also you might have language, two languages B, French and English, for example, to translate them into Arabic and so on and so forth. And so the second uh, uh, item or competency is knowledge. To interpret effectively and confidently and relevantly, an interpreter must have certain items related to knowledge. Knowledge can be general. You have to have a general knowledge of the world the geopolitics in, of the world, what is going on in the world, the maps of the world, the politics, and everything else. You have to be aware of that. And a socio-cultural knowledge, basically of the two uh, languages, the source of the source language and the target language. You have to be aware to make the conversion and the transfer more successfully. You have to be aware of the socio-cultural specificities of each community. And the third one is domain-specific, means the knowledge of the topics under discussion, knowledge of transitional justice, for example, and how it is being carried out as a process in other countries such as South uh, Africa, in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, you have to be aware of that. So this is a domain specific. And also a context specific means the context of the event itself. Who are the participants? Who is going to speak? What is his background? And skills, indispensable for interpreters, basically the listening and speaking skills. So this is the S. And uh, finally, professionalism. Definitely, you need to have the skills and norms and behaviors and knowledge that are desirable to fulfill your task more smoothly and effectively. Here, uh, professionalism means to be on time. It has to do with the dress also. It has to do with the way you articulate and then certain things. It has to do with uh, so many other things related to the conduct of the interpreter and some other ethical issues. Ethical issues. And some of them, professionalism, means how to look professional. How to look professional. Active listening. So this is the third item on the agenda. What does it mean, active listening? But before we get into the details of active listening, let's address the listening skill in general. If you, you cannot have this, engage into this active listening without getting the emotions and digging deep into uh, the, 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 peop the people and the persons with whom you are having an exchange. 
without invading the personal space of people. Without invading the personal space of people. You cannot be successful as a trainer. And here I have an example of a trainer in police reform, in a police reform program. And he's, he's police. But he said that I can only be successful as a coach or a trainer if I invade the personal space of the people involved in that interpreted event. But here there is a question mark because invading the personal space directly using the same language is one thing and invading the personal space using an interpreter or a mediator is another thing. And he's going to report in a very short clip report his experience on using interpreters and on uh, invading the personal space of trainees, basically. Um, I, I think it's very much, particularly with the, the body language, uh, as a trainer, I talk with my hands and express with my hands, you with, you hands with my hands. Uh, I use very open body gestures, uh, and I like when I'm talking to people to get very close and personal with them when I'm, when I'm talking. Uh, I've found with a lot of interpreters, maybe it's a cultural thing, I don't know, um, don't like to get personal with people. And by personal, I mean invading somebody's personal space when they're talking to them. Um, and a lot of time in what we do in a security training, you need that personal contact in order to convey a point and a meaning that sometimes you cannot just convey by the use of language alone. Exactly. So do you feel that some interpreters are shy just to go beyond, and uh, is this your feeling or not, beyond the task assigned to them, just language mediator, and they go beyond to express something from themselves? Uh, yes. I, I think certainly with the first point, um, maybe it is slight shyness, but then I'm also aware, having worked in the security industry and dealt with people for 30 years I'm used to being in people's personal space it doesn't cause me a problem however I can understand somebody who may be from a different background uh, might not be comfortable with being in somebody's personal space um, I appreciate that but sometimes I need some, some, somebody to maybe enter that personal space in order to deliver or convey a meaning and, and again this is not language this is uh, about body language everyone has his so it's also about body language it's also about body language and evading the personal space is necessary to get the meaning across but also to receive another meaning so invading the personal space. Listening in everyday life. Uses of listening. So we listen to certain stuff to do what? So if I might ask you this, 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 this question. We listen to get what? To do what? Any answer? Yes? Uh, we listen to get information. Great, to get information. Perfect. What else? Uh, we listen to, uh, to get a better understanding. We listen to get a better understanding. Great, what else? Well, yes. Uh, we listen to engage in uh, communication. To engage in a communication. Is it an end? in itself, communication, or it is just a tool for another end. I think communication is not an end in itself. It is just a tool, a means. What else? Yes, please. Uh, we listen to interpret. We listen to interpret. Yes, we listen for enjoyment, for music. 
We listen to learn and we listen to interpret. But definitely the listening for mode level differs from one stage to another, from one end to another. But how much information you get every day? I, we've said that there is too much talking going on. But how much do you get? If we, uh, let's say, the, 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 the rate, the listening, or the hearing, and the understanding or receiving rate, if there is a rate, what this rate would be, according to you. There is too much talking going on. When you go home, you will have your mother and, and, and then your friends. And when you are here in the classroom, you have your teacher who is very talkative and you, kept, you keep on listening to so much stuff every day. But toward the end of the day, what is the amount of information? What is the amount of understanding you uh, come up with? 30%. Uh, 30%. 30%. Anyone else? Great. So, so this is the remembering and hearing great. The remembering and hearing great is, varies, depending on the situation and whether you are interested or not. And it ranges from 25% to 40 to 50 uh, in, in, in best cases. So 50% means at the end of the day, you will be having half of what you have heard is getting lost is getting lost. But this doesn't work in an interpreted event. <laughs> if you lose the 50% of the message. So here we need to engage into some active listening to make this rate higher. There is always a loss. But to achieve to, uh, to a rate of 80% and, 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 and or so. So why, why things are lost, are being lost in a conversation or a communication or a dialogue? Because we are listening, but also our minds and thoughts, they escape to other areas, to other spaces. Because sometimes what I'm saying now is unknown to you, and people, they fear the unknown, so they would like to escape to some safety area, something that you already know. And you will be trying to relate what is being said to what you already know, what you have already stored in your memories, because it is safe. So it is a quest for safety. That's why, or the other uh, reason is that when you are in exchange, a Q&A or an interview, you are listening to the interviewer or the interviewee, but at the same time you are preparing for the answer. When you are preparing for the answer, this definitely will not allow you to engage into that active listening. There is an exercise. I have learned this exercise in uh, the area of therapy, psychological therapy. And this exercise involves some meditation in which you sit over a pillow or a chair and you close your eyes. I would like to invite you now all, just to feel safe, the room is very safe. Close your eyes, everyone, please. Close your eyes without any noise, please. Can you please close that door? Close your eyes. And
great. Now, can I ask you what thoughts have crossed your minds? Can you open your eyes back? Thank you. Yes. I was trying to not to open my eyes first. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Yes, please. A moment of release. Good. But there is another stage in this exercise. Now, I would like to invite you to close your eyes and try to avoid any thought. Try to kick any thought coming to your mind out. Try not to think of anything, but there is a trick here. If you find it very difficult and hard to do, try to think of your breath. Breath. Deep here. Try to think of your breath. Shahiq with Zafir. Try to think of it. If you cannot help, help uh, not thinking of anything. Great. Is it more successful than the first time or more difficult? It is easier now. Why? Because you, you will be thinking of some source of so your safety. It's breath. It's life. Because it is your life. You will be thinking of something safe. Now, active listening involves some similar exercise. Just not to be distracted by noise, background noise. When you were doing the exercise, there, were, there was some noise coming from outside the room, but you didn't care. And I think that in, if we relate this to religion, in so many religions, they call this al khushua not to be distracted, just to focus on what you are doing and meditation. It's a khushua. So I think that interpreting is a prayer that requires that meditation, khushua. You keep focused because you will be distracted. And I have so many examples here on interpreters being distracted by background noise, so many other things, how to keep focused. Not, and not to be distracted and to avoid the escaping minds. Active listening, definition. Active listening is when you make a conscious effort to hear and understand people so that you get the complete message, not half of the message, the complete message. Active listening is both trust inducing. If I listen to you quite carefully, you will trust me. You will put your trust on me. And also, it is healing. When you have somebody that can listen to you, to your suffering, to your emotions, this is healing. So this is the stage beyond listening and active listening. It is healing. And here, I have an example, a testimony by a therapist a psychological therapist who is doing some healing to t survivors of torture and people who have been subjected to violence. In a circle, they meditate, they talk, and they listen to each one another quite carefully without interruption. This is very healing because these, this community is being rejected by society. So, I would like to show this example to you to use it in your interpreting exercise. And how to, because if you listen quite well to, you, to the speaker, then this is trust inducing. He will trust you and you will trust him. And definitely interpreting quality is also a matter of trust. If he doesn't trust you, then he will doubt any uh, interpretation you are doing.
having a very clear understanding of what's going on with someone is pretty crucial. Exactly. You know, you know, if I have half an understanding or a quarter understanding, you know, that's not likely to build trust very easily because I'm not, I'm not really getting it. You know, trust, um, I think, again, something happened today. Someone, I think it was uh, one of the members. Yes. And I reflected something back to them, okay. which wasn't quite what they said. And actually they said, yes, exactly. That was it. Uh, it uh, so I was able to say a word that they hadn't got to, but the word expressed more clearly what they were trying to say. Uh, and that was then very trust-inducing because it told the person that I was paying very, very close attention to what they were saying. Good. Right. Now, clearly, uh, if there is a kind of language barrier between us, that's going to be much more difficult. So can emotions be interpreted using an interpreter? And whether it is more difficult than translating discourses? Well, I mean, I think... Um, I mean, clear. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, when I work with individuals um, in another organization, I, I use interpreters. Um, and clearly then, it's, it's, not, it's no longer a two-way relationship, it's a three-way relationship. Um, and the three-way relationship will work dependent on trust at the end of the day. If, if it's very clear to me, for example, um, that the interpreter is somehow... N- simply interpreting the words, okay. actually, as opposed to the, the feeling of the person, the feeling that comes with the words, I'm not going to be very happy because I'm not then getting the person. I'm not really getting the message of the person. I'm having to, I mean, obviously, I'm doing, my own, I'm doing my own best to try and read the body language of the person anyway. Yes. And very often, I can tell when... The, interpret, the interpreting is not quite right because actually what they're saying doesn't fit the body language. And so I might say, are you sure that's what they're saying? Can you ask them again? Because I'm, I'm picking up something a bit, a bit different here. But yeah. uh, also, aren't you concerned that the interpreter will add some of his feeling and feelings or emotions to the, to, to, to the meaning expressed? Yeah, and, and, often, and often that's exactly what happens. Um... um and I think again, I rely on the, I rely on the person. So, like, I think when that happens, I'm constantly. It's a matter of trust. Then. Well, but also I'm constantly reading both of them. So, um, if the interpreter is, is somehow is communicating something that is not there in the person, mm-hmm. the person will, by and large, the person will also let me know, one way or another, that that's what's happening. That's good. Do you require in this sense that the interpreter should be part and parcel of the group? Sorry, do I? The, the interpreter to be part and parcel, a member of the group? Absolutely, yeah. Why? Um, um, because, fundamentally, because they're a human being. Okay. And they might be interpreting. Okay. But they also, they also, um, they're doing all sorts of other things as well. <laughs> So, as you can see, it's a matter of trust, inducing. How you get, how you are uh, trusted by the other participants. And uh, he has, this guy has a very uh, unique way of healing the survivors of torture by listening listening and uh, when they set the meeting in a circle he would like to show to all of the this is a community and he works on community building because these people have been rejected by the community by the outside community so it's another community it's identity and the circle is the symbol of equality also and here, active listening is, is healing also. Um, listening, I would say, is 
probably the key discipline, to use that word, um, listening. Um, uh, I think by and large, people are not, typically, are not really used to being listened to. Right? Um, and I think one of the results of the fact that actually, as a species, we're not really l used to being listened to, is that and a lot of the time we actually don't know who we are. You know? Exactly. Um, and so it's, it can be actually a truly wonderful experience to be properly listened to because it doesn't happen very often. Um, and when you're listened to, and particularly when you're listened to and that listening is actually fed back to you, so you get to hear yourself, you get to hear your own utterances. Uh, utterances that perhaps you might have spoken, but that you don't somehow know fully yourself. To that degree, you get to know yourself in a different kind of way and have yourself confirmed and valued. Uh, and I think all of that goes on in the act of listening. Listening. Yeah. Good. Yeah. To feel that you are valued. Yes. Well, to... Um, one of my... Probably my greatest... Well, yeah, one of my kind of mentors... Um, is a woman called Helen Bamber, and she, she actually, she founded the Medical Foundation for Victims of Torture, and she was one of the kind of founding Amnesty mm -hmm. members. Um, and she herself set up the Medical Foundation because she said, okay, well, it's, yes, it's fine to do all this campaigning work, but we actually have people in this country that have suffered all these terrible things, and actually they themselves need to be listened to, right, interestingly <laughs> enough. And she started her life, her kind of working life, um, at the tender age of 19, going to, um, to Auschwitz um, after, after the concentration camp was liberated um, and listening to the inmates of Auschwitz. Right? Um, and the whole point was, of course, there was there was nothing else to do, or rather all that you could do as, a human, as another human being was to listen. There was no remedy, there was no fix, there was no solution, but what you could do as another human being was, and, and she used the expression to bear witness, you could actually bear witness to the suffering of another person. As you can see, listening can also be healing. And in concentration camps, inmates, correctional facilities, uh, sometimes you cannot do anything for some people, refugees, but just to listen to their stories, listen to their suffering. This is the only thing you can do. Now, there are four approaches to listening, and we are going to focus on the last of them, the last form uh, or approach to listening. Let's assume that there is a weather forecast report on the radio, and let's assume that you are relaxing home with a cup of coffee and you have no intention, intention to go out whatsoever. You have very nice heating system or air conditioning system at home and you don't care. And you receive the radio and this report. So here, in this case, you will be having a passive listening. You simply don't care. Just receiving the sound, perhaps some one word or two words, but you don't care. So this is called passive listening. Now, the second approach to listening is superficial, 
when you listen to the same weather forecast as a way to improve your English, if it is coming from the BBC, World Service, or uh, uh, France Inter, you would like to improve your French, or Arabic uh, media, or from an, Arab, uh, an, Arab, an Arabic outlet. So you will, be, you will be focusing on certain terms, technical terms, what is being said, and so on and so forth. Even in, 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 uh, in Arabic, you, c you might improve your, your language, as I have uh, said last time, you might uh, be having a clear idea about uh, what shluq is, what uh, shirsh is, what barani is, and what shili is, and where they, the, the, these winds blow from. So, uh, so here it is called a superficial listening. Now, let's assume that you are going to Paris. And uh, there is uh, France 24, for example, there is the weather report, and you are concerned only about the weather in Paris. For not today, because you are not traveling today, tomorrow, starting from tomorrow. So you will be very selective, just waiting for this information to unfold to pay more attention. And you don't care about the weather forecast in Japan or Tokyo or Latin America. I don't care. I don't care. So this is selective. And the last approach is the active listening. And here you had to listen and to be able to retell in full the whole message of the weather report to cover everything, definitely in proportions, for example, where uh, you will be given some time to retell the section of the report on Latin America and then on Tunisia and so on and so forth. But you have to be very faithful to pay attention to every single detail because your interpreting will be used to act as the original report, it will be used by those who are going to travel to Paris or those who are going to travel to Latin America or those who are staying in Tunisia. So this needs active listening. Any question so far? Any question? Great. So tips to improve active listening skills. Eye contact with the speaker whether it is simultaneous or consecutive. Simultaneous, behind the glass, you have to look into the, uh, f the, 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 the speaker and try to, uh, to capture the facial expression, the posture, and the body language. And it is very much recommended that the booth faces the speaker and you be facing the speaker. And also, this applies to consecutive, in the consecutive setting. You have to look into the speaker and to have that eye contact. The second, avoid being distracted by environmental factors such as somebody who is getting into the room, moving, shaking some tables or there are some side conversation over there. Don't be distracted. Or, for example, there is a bird singing outside or there is a, like some noise earlier and the gentleman has closed uh, the, 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 the window, don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. And you need to train yourself not to be distracted. And here, this is very difficult and hard for women. They are very much shocked, very easily shocked, and say, wow. So try to resist that. And put aside distracting thoughts. We have already done the exercise. M meditation. Khushua. Try to engage into that because it is a matter of training. And also use contextual cues to understand accents. Sometimes you will be interpreting for an Indian guy whose accent is simply horrible. It's very hard to understand. Is this English or an Irish guy? Or an Irish guy or a Scotch? Try to focus. Try to focus and engage into that active listening exercise 
to try to adapt, to understand, and to use the contextual cues. And here I have an example. It's a, a stand-up comedy. Somebody mimicking Filipinos. <laughs> and then try to read people and their feelings. Look for emotions. And I have another testimony here. Listen to the speaker's body language. Body language needs to be listened to as well. Try to the eye contact. Don't speak and you are doing like that. Try to observe the body language of the participants. Yes? Look into the eyes. Look into the facial expressions. Try to capture something. Maybe the other participant has not got the idea quite well. And this will be reflected in his face or her face. Perhaps there was a need for you to retell or re, uh, rephrase the same sentence again. And avoid the pitfalls of personal fillers and judgments. Fillers, mm, oh, etc. Try to avoid them. If the original speaker is saying, try to avoid them. Don't translate them. Try to, try to uh, fill that gap with some words, with some meaningful utterances. Like, you know, the Bay of Tunisia, when he conducted a visit uh, on a state visit to, the United, uh, to France, and he was having a tour uh, by, led by the king of France, and he wanted to show him the uh, paintings in the uh, Versailles Palace about that branch of art painting. He's not interested. So he kept on saying, and he was looking at the paintings, and the, um, the king was explaining the history and the artist and the beauty and so on, and it took uh, just uh, five minutes to explain, and he says, And the interpreter was translating something else. Oh, that's really beautiful. I really like the colors, etc. <laughs> and then the king ended up by saying, Oh, that's really great, this language, Arabic language, with just two syllables, bub, bub. We express all of this. <laughs> so, and this is the uh, interpreter and how he should sometimes um, avoid the pitfalls of personal fillers. Mm, or uh, uh, you have to avoid that uh, you see and especially Tunisians they excel in fillers like that if you give the mic to someone just speak like that. and he says nothing he says nothing <laughs> So, and also judgments. Don't judge the original speaker. Don't say he has a poor accent or his uh, knowledge of the language, English, for example, uh, is very poor. No. And when listening and analyzing, look for meaning and logic and not for words. And we have had a test with MA2 and those who were successful, who passed the test, were those who could focus on logic and the meaning. But those who failed the test are those who focused more on the words. I don't know how to translate that word. And they were, yes. So avoid placing an emphasis on words. Words are only there to serve logic, the overall meaning. So, <laughs> there are some, some words, part of the swearing, so I, I'm sorry for that from the very beginning, but it is really telling to watch this guy. I, might, I think you know him. He's called Russell Peters. And you need to read uh, people and their feelings, because this will make your task easy if you engage 
with people at the level of emotions and not at the level of the mind. Try to get uh, into the feelings and emotions. As an interpreter, this will save you a lot of effort. But try to know them early in advance. If they are your friends, people whom you know quite well, this will make your task, as I've said, much easier. Why? Because th perhaps they might be saying still complex things. But all of a sudden, your task has become easier because you could get to the emotional area of that, that person. So here is an invitation to read people and their, their feelings. Our emotional life is like the heart of who we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, if we're hurt, then in all sorts of ways, we cover our heart. No? We cover our feeling. Um, to build shields. We build shields, yes, because we, we've learned that it's not safe. It's not safe to actually, it's not safe to communicate our hearts. You know. um, and so, so then the process of, of, of almost of necessity, the process of getting back to feeling in the sense of communicating kind of genuine feeling as opposed to, um, uh, how should we say, kind of reactionary feeling. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, I, someone on um, someone who has been through very traumatic experiences, depending on their personality, on the one hand, maybe very, very withdrawn, mm -hmm. right, and withdraw from their feeling. On the other hand, they may be just very angry and resentful all the time, and, and, uh, and disposed to kind of hitting out all the time. On both sides, the feelings don't really reflect what's, what's in their heart. Exactly. They reflect the covering of the heart. The covering. Yes. Why people tend to have that cover, that uh, Be shield? Because it's not... It's for a defensive measure? Yes, because it's, as I was saying, because people have learned that it's not safe. It's not safe to reveal their naked feeling. But again, we might not express this in words. Can this be visible in the person through other means, through other channels, for example? You mean, Let's say you mean, body language, you mean, for example. You mean, can their feeling be visible? Yes. Um, if they, 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 they build that shield, can we still access the emotion or, 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 or the feeling using another road? Is it possible? Well, I'm not sure about accessing. I mean, I'm not sure about that word. I think you can, you know, I'm part of the, part of the kind of job uh -huh. of... Uh, of a therapist yeah. is to learn to read people, no? To read. To read people and to read emotion, including hidden emotion. <laughs> That's part of the job. Yes. Uh, Let me so use the reading now mm. in, instead of accessing. Mm. How can you read? Um, well, so for example, um, um, a, a, a classic example. Yes. Um, maybe somebody who is saying something which somehow connotes anxiety or fear. Okay. Right? Okay. But at the same time, is smiling. Right? So there's a kind of disconnect. There's a disconnect between what their face is doing okay. and the words that they're using. So the difference between body language and the uttered words. Yes. Right? And... So... As, as, and as a skilled facilitator, yes. you might actually reflect on that disjunction okay. and the reflection potentially can open the person to the feeling, the actual feeling behind that. Great. Yes, but how possibly. also can you play on, on, on the environment to make that person comfortable so that he or she 
will be uh, uh, more spontaneously forthcoming and sharing. Well, uh, well we're back to trust. We're, we're, to trust. We're, we're back to the kind of the slow creation of trust. So look for emotions, language and emotions. We are not going to uh, see this. So now we move on to the public speaking part, the second part. And how the interpreter is uh, a, a public speaker, an excellent public speaker. Uh, there are common denominators between an interpreter and a public speaker. One of them is, as an interpreter, you are a public speaking professional. Sometimes you can be called to train people on how to speak in public. The second thing is that the basic characteristics, in general, of a good interpreter are also the characteristics for a, a good speaker. Both of them, they have to be calm, clear, and confident. Calm, clear, and confident. And also, both need to focus on what is being said and not being distracted by the environment or other things, such as the monotonous intonation of the speaker. Some speakers, they are speaking in such a monotonous way that you will wish to fall asleep. But you have to not to be distracted with that. You have to create a more interesting discourse in your interpretation. And also to avoid fillers, mm, oh, etc. So you have to feel not like ba, 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 and you say all oh, this course or a paragraph. Not to that extent. Uh, and also to avoid accents. Uh, both of them should not look or sound nervous or unconvincing. Because if you are nerves, all of the audience will feel that stress. And the trust will be lost. The trust will be lost. So try to engage in an exercise on how to manage your anxiety, languas, how to manage your nervousness. It also needs to be the uh, subject of an advanced exercise on how. And we are going to see some uh, examples here on how to do that. Nervous and unconvincing interpreter. I have found this extract. I would like to invite you to watch it carefully. And how being nervous as an interpreter is disastrous. An interpreter of a speech delivered by the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad aired on CNN. And I know the person, he was called at, on, on the spot just to interpret. And you will see what the result might be. It is disastrous. Welcome back. Uh, some news uh, for you. Uh, Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, is uh, speaking to the nation live in his country, Syria. Let's listen in. Uh, I, I, I didn't talk before. I, I, want, I didn't want to be, I don't want to deliver propaganda. I, want, I wanted to talk to you about what we achieved and what we are about to achieve. Uh, this, uh, uh, many rumors have been spreading around, uh, is spreading around in the country. Uh, uh, the time factor is important. Every day, uh, new information come uh, through. Many matters have failed, whether they were from the public or uh, from the military and the security service, and many more were injured. They were a great loss to their people and a loss to the nation. And to me, it is uh, a true loss. And I pray to God and uh, uh, ask uh, for mercy on all those mitres, uh, mitres and my condolences to their families. Uh, 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 these 
weaknesses. We, we don't talk about conspiracy. This doesn't allow us to... Uh, we have to push those people from the wrong path and uh, try to embarrass them in society. Uh, well, uh, 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 some of uh, of the, the, the uh, 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 for many decades it has developed into a new ways and uh, hide in darkness and uh, jump on every opportunity whenever opportunity allow and uh, spread chaos in the name of freedom it is very sad that that uh, uh, some people to live this is a very good example on how and how an interpreter needs to be a good public speaker. Because <clears throat> when you get into that very vicious circle of something bad generating some other th thing that is bad too, you the result will be disastrous. And the psychological factor is key to the is critical and it is part of the problem but also can be part of the solution. So that's why we need to work on some psychological factors to get ready and not to be distracted because he was distracted with the speed of Bashar al-Assad. He was reading his uh, speech address and he had no clue uh, about what he's going to say next. So here you need to articulate or to select, to be selective. But the cognitive load was heavier than he might uh, or he expected. So the result was <coughs> really uh, very funny. Now, public speaking across cultures, very briefly, <coughs> any questions so far about what we have covered? So far, any question? Anything not clear? Yes, please. Can you please use the mic? Thank you. Uh, I noticed that even his language was uh, poor. How come that, uh, they chose him? By the way, he's a good interpreter. This interpreter is a good interpreter. But this is a very clear example on how when you are under too much pressure, when you are nervous, when you don't put the psychological factors on your side, the roads to your memory and what you know, the knowledge, will be blocked, will be interrupted. All of a sudden, what you, don't, what you know, you start not to know at all, as if everything is very new to you, as if everything is very strange. What are you saying? You do not believe in what you are saying yourself. So you lost trust in yourself and definitely the other the audience and the viewers in this case, and this is the CNN, huh? not any media outlet, it's the CNN. They will definitely lose trust in what you are saying. So this means that it is not enough to know. It is not enough to have good knowledge of the subject area. It is also very important in the interpreting exercise to uh, engage into an exercise in which you can bring the psychological factors to back you, to back you up and not to be your enemy or to be hostile to you. So it is your work as an interpreter to make this happen. But you cannot make this happen in, on the day of the event because this needs some preparation, some training. And here is one of them, the very first step 
to, in their training, is to be aware of the problem first. You have to know that everyone is nervous when speaking in public, and I'm going to speak about this later. But allow me now to give you a bit of history uh, and, and, and uh, about public speaking and speak public speaking across cultures. It is really very important and popular, public speaking, but we tend to pay very uh, n not much attention to this aspect of our daily life or our daily life and we interpreters and translators and linguists we are called upon to work on this area more seriously because this is the the income that we are going to have will be generated through activities like public speaking because after all, an interpreter is a public speaker. Rhetoric, which is a form of public speaking, al balagha hmm, has been studied and practiced in various forms throughout the world for almost 2,000 years now. For almost 2,000 years now. So there are long-standing traditions of rhetoric and public speaking in Africa, in Asia, in Europe and the West in general. So Western tradition, we have Aristotle who has written a book called Rhetoric. And in Rhetoric, he has identified three main skills for a good public speaker or public speaking. And here, and we are using this up to the present time. Logos, which is the logos means the logic how to make your argument very logic so the reason and pathos how to engage into an emotional interaction with your audience pathos how to make your argument more attractive how to get deep into the emotions and feelings of your audience if you are speaking from your heart, then the message will reach, reach the hearts, reach up to the hearts. But if you are speaking with your tongue, then the message will not go beyond the ear. You have to speak from the bottom of your heart. This is the source of logic, to speak to the hearts. In the United States of America, speech is considered to be an object of inquiry or fact-finding. There, there, there are much, much and many statistics in any speech. So they are looking for facts and not for the rhetoric per se. The rhetoric and the public speaking as a rhetoric uh, when it is used for other ends in some other traditions such as in Africa. Public speaking is closely related to the values of communities and tribes. Public speaking is there to promote the cohesion of a community, to resolve disputes, conflicts. Public speaking is used, and this, these skills are also used to maintain the loyalty to a community. I have seen in Africa, in Tanzania, in Mali, Uganda, some people who are really poor. They are living in misery and they are coming from remote villages to a center, whether it is a town, a small town, and they are only there just to speak, to flex their muscles in rhetoric and, and, and public speaking. They are very poor. They cannot afford for their daily food. But despite that, it's a form of identity just to speak and to show that they have some, they have some skill they can show and to be recognized, confirmed, and valued like it has been said by Mark Fish earlier. And here, Speaking is as necessary as food. Uh, and also Kofi Annan, who is Ghanian, a, a Ghanian diplomat, he, was, he had been an excellent speaker in his community in Ghana. And this, the, the public speaking skill, led him to be the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations. Not only that, 
he was very successful in convincing world, world leaders about so many causes using his skills of a good public speaker. And eventually he could win the 2001 Nobel Peace Prize together with the United Nations. And now he is a member of the Council of, of the Elders, Majlis al Hukama al Alam. Islamic and Arabic tradition, public speaking is used to, uh, uh, and persuasion and oral discourse in, in general are being used in Islamic and Arabic and Arabic uh, tradition to promote the message of Allah. To be used as one of the most educational coaching and influential means. And here also in the uh, Arabic and Islamic tradition, public speaking is being used, especially in rural areas, to solve problems. In the South, there, was an, uh, there were events. They are called al-mi'ad. Mi'ad. This is a very nice term when the community leaders, they, they, they come together and sometimes they will be having a feast around and they slaughter a sheep and they try to resolve a problem. Whether a, a, husband, a problem between a husband and a wife or an, a, a dispute or a conflict over land or water and so on. So public speaking here is very important, even in this culture, the Islamic and uh, uh, Arabic culture. And the Friday sermons, what are they? It's public speaking. But also, on the other hand, the audience, the prayers, the worshippers, they have to engage in active listening. And active listening ha has become a principle not to violate. To observe and not violate. And the violation is called the lagu. Means if you say to your neighbor, listen, you have violated the principle of active listening. Any questions so far? Anxiety management in public speaking. You need to have your anxiety under control. Why? Because if you do not have it under control, the result will be exactly like that very poor interpreter who was put on fire. And uh, there are so many reports, studies, and surveys conducted and up to 85% of the people surveyed, they stated and confirmed that they are nervous when they speak in public. And I think that the remaining 15% 15, 15 are lying. <laughs> they are liars. Why? Because however confident you are, situations can be put to you to feel nervous. So nervousness and pressure and anxiety is a human thing. We cannot, we have to recognize that. And if we recognize that fact, this is a relief. Everyone can be nervous, even Putin himself. And I will show you some, a little bit nervous. Now, anxiety in fact helps us uh, because there is an amount of adrenaline that is going up and this is a new energy for us. It gives us energy, it helps us focus. How does it feel like when you are sitting in an audience watching a nervous speaker or watching a nervous interpreter? It's a bad feeling. It is uncomfortable. It feels very awkward. So what we do sometimes, we start nodding like that just uh, by way of encouraging the speaker, but this will not help. The evil is already there. Or sometimes we tend to distract and disengage. So that he can regain his trust, and, but this will not help. The vicious circle is already there. 
even Putin can act as an interpreter and can be nervous a little bit. Now, a question and answer session at a journalist forum in the Russian city of St. Petersburg saw President Putin stepping into the shoes of an interpreter. After a question from the audience over Russian national values, Vladimir Putin jumped in to translate the speech of a former German MP. Herr Präsident, da bin ich aber gründlich missverstanden worden. Ich habe schon gesagt, dass wir... Меня, меня неправильно поняли, говорит наш гость. Hey, ja. Ja, да. Пожалуйста, пожалуйста. Пр продолжайте, пожалуйста. Bitte schön. Sprechen Sie bitte ich weiter. Hab, ich habe mich gewundert, dass die russischen Vertreter davon gesprochen haben, dass es keine nationalen Werte gibt. Я очень был удивлен, что представитель России говорит о том, что у нас нет национальных ценностей. Und ich habe aus meiner Sicht gesagt, wenn ich als Ausländer auf Russland blicke, dann stelle ich sehr wohl fest, was für Russland spricht. Und wenn ich als Inostranier auf Russland blicke, dann ist für mich klar, was sie sagen. Das ist die Beachtung des Völkerrechts. Das ist die Beachtung des Friedens. Das ist die Beachtung des Friedens. Das ist die Beachtung des Friedens. Sie stehen für die Werte der Nation, за интересы нации. Sie stehen für die Werte der Familie, за ценности семьи. Und sie stehen für die Werte des. There was some pressure on him, but this is Putin. This is one thing, the lesson that can be drawn from this video. The second lesson is that Vladimir Putin is using. His own way of speaking and the public speaking abilities and skills when translating. That's why, when you are interpreting, you will be using your own skills. But you need to develop your own skill as an independent public speaker. I had the chance to translate a speech uttered, delivered by Putin. Uh, several months ago through his interpreter from Russian into English and then English into Arabic. The task was not easy, definitely because there is the relay through another language, but also uh, Putin uses, not like here, the body language is not very visible with little facial expression. So Tips to improve public speaking skills. Public speaking skills, they have to do with the body language and so on and so forth, but because this applies to both consecutive interpreting and uh, simultaneous interpreting, especially simultaneous, when you are not visible, so I will focus on the verbal side of the uh, skills. So first of all, project your voice. You speak aloud enough to be heard by people, clearly audible, to all. Second, eliminate all fillers. Mm, uh, like that very poor interpreter. You have seen so many fillers. And then pause instead, if necessary, some. And I have another video about silence, but I, we are not going to watch it for the interest of time. Control your speed. Don't speak too fast or too slow. Something in between. Observe that. Don't rush ahead breathlessly. Vary your pitch, vary your pitch, sometimes out loud, sometimes soft, like that. To awake your audience if they fall asleep. Uh, enunciate clearly, you have to pronounce clearly, articulate clearly as an interpreter. This is, all of the interp professional interpreters I know, they enunciate their speech very clearly. تعطي لكل حرف حقه في الخروج. Don't mumble, like the poor interpreter was mumbling. Or slur your words. تكلهم في الأخير. Pronounce names, titles, unusual terms and numbers, especially clearly. Seventeen with seventy. تبتلي. It makes a hell of difference, especially with bankers. If you are working with bankers. A hell of difference, 70% or 70%, and million or billion. <laughs> stress the right words when there is something important to stress on it. 
And if the speaker starts stumbling, don't mimic him. Don't mimic that. When you started. In general, as a general advice, you have to be or at least act confident, sincere, and natural. Because confidence is trust-inducing. And when you are trusted, you will be held credible. And your message will be taken for granted. Not to doubt what you are saying. Case study, first case study. Uh, some of my uh, students have watched uh, uh, part, of, part of this, but we are going to watch it again with a better sound quality. It was a poor sound quality last time. And I would like to invite you to, um, this is a case of consecutive. I was the interpreter. And I would like to invite you to watch and I have some report back later, or uh, feedback on the experience itself. So there was some introduction, just to set the context for this event. احتضنته العاصمة الكونغولية برازافيل يتعلق باجتماع مشترك بين اللجنة العليا للاتحاد الافريقي حول ليبيا والمجلس الاعلى للقبائل والمدن الليبية للاستماع لوجهة نظر زعماء وشيوخ القبائل والمدن الليبية بخصوص الحل للملف الليبي. برازافيل عاصمة جمهورية الكونغو ننقل لكم هذه التغطية لحدث عربي افريقي مهم يتعلق بالحوار الليبي الافريقي. بتأسيس مسار جديد للمصالحة ولتسوية الأزمة الليبية الاجتماع أشرف عليه رئيس جمهورية الكونغو المكلف من قبل الاتحاد الافريقي وهو يرأس اللجنة العليا الافريقية لملف الأزمة الليبية وبحضور ممثلي كل القبائل والمدن الليبية الذين حضروا هذا الاجتماع وشاركوا وأبدوا وجهات نظرهم بخصوص حل الأزمة الليبية. Le président du Conseil des villes et tribus libyennes. A rappelé l'objet de cette réunion qui vise à ramener l'unité du peuple libyen qui souffre depuis 2011. Il a ensuite présenté la situation actuelle de la Libye. Caractérisé par les violations graves des droits de l'homme. Qui peuvent être qualifiés de crimes de guerre et crimes contre l'humanité. L'exploitation sauvage des ressources du pays par des groupes armés. Et les maltraitances des migrants africains. S'agissant des accusations portées contre la Libye. Ou 
au sujet de la traite des migrants africains. Le Haut Conseil, tout en désapprouvant ces actes ignobles, a indiqué qu'ils sont l'œuvre de certains groupes criminels qui profitent de l'instabilité du pays. Il a également réitéré les espoirs que le peuple libyen place en l'Union africaine. Son comité de haut niveau et les Nations unies pour la résolution de la crise libyenne. Prenant la parole à son tour, le président du comité de haut niveau de l'Union africaine sur la Libye, a remercié la délégation du Haut Conseil des villes et tribus libyennes pour avoir accepté son invitation. Il a rappelé les conclusions du sommet du comité de haut niveau de l'Union africaine sur la Libye tenu le 9 septembre 2017 à Brazzaville. Qui avait adopté une feuille de route et retenu entre autres le lancement des échanges entre les comités de dialogue. Ainsi que la poursuite des pourparlers inter-libyens. Il a appelé le Haut Conseil à s'impliquer davantage. Dans la rue. Great. I would like to report on this experience. Uh, sometimes uh, you can be very easily distracted. The interpreters were in their booths, and all of a sudden there was a technical problem. And that was the final declaration of the summit or the meeting. And the interpreters are. Uh, the two, inter two interpreters, one into Arabic and one into French, were called out of their booths. So there was not expected. When you are in the booth, there are certain techniques you are going to use. And if you are not used to public speaking, the result might be disastrous as well. Uh, some of the interpreters I know, they are teachers, professors, and they are being helped by the skills they have acquired over decades or years in their teaching responsibilities to speak in public. So uh, speaking in public in an audience or a room like that is something and speaking in public for the media is something else. You have to articulate, enunciate. You have to bear because if you are speaking to the media, you are speaking in, case, in this case, to the Arabs, all the Arabs. And not here, I know, only to here, Arabs. So this will definitely, uh, this knowledge, will be, have an, uh, an impact on the words you are going to select. If you are interpreting for Libyans 
and, 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 and the Arabs, you have to choose particular words, such as the names of months. And also, you have to remind, because also you are aware that there is uh, consecutive interpreting, and the audience will be distracted by the section of French, sometimes you need, and there was a question asked it, uh, uh, earlier, why the interpreter is uh, 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 reminding the audience of the name of the committee each time. That is also part of the communicative uh, purpose. It is to remind, because they might forget. And especially that there are two committees. Lajna, Al-Afriqiyya, Rafi'at Al-Mustawa, Kada, Wa Al-Majlis, Lajna Al-Majlis, Al-A'la Al-Qabail Wal-Mudun Libya. So two. That's why you need to uh, keep this in mind and be clear. This is a clarity. And speak confidently also. Clear, enunciate. And if we go back to the, the project your voice. And then control your speed. Don't, don't speak, uh, don't rush to uh, ahead. And, and, and try to vary your pitch and to articulate to folks and, and to stress on certain uh, words and try to speak confident and sincere and natural. Uh, despite the fact that uh, there were so many challenges and it is not a stress-free environment. Yes, please. Try to speak to the market. Uh, I noticed it was a, a consecutive interpreting. Did you take some notes? Uh, I am of the kind of people who do not like to take notes. Because I, if I am engaging in active listening with a bit of proportion of what is being said, it's not long, uh, lo there are not long chunks that are uttered, so no need. And especially this is the final declaration, means the end of a uh, working day a working day, and I am already familiar with the names of the committees, with the jargon, and so on. So there is no need. I get it. Because the final declaration is a preparation of the activities and the sessions. And the sessions, despite the fact that you had no clue about the final declaration, and there are certain things that are added in the final declaration that was not there in the sessions, such as Al-Mutahida and so on, but you have to cope with the, the, the new unfolding information. Uh, also, taking note in front of the media is not very much recommended. Uh, and here we have another uh, example. Taking, and the uh, interpreter is simply, is simply ignored, and there, we, the, there was very much room for destruction. Yes, please. Um, did you take a look into the speech before interpreting? Not exactly. Uh, the speech was uh, being prepared by the African side, means the presidency of the, uh, of the Republic of uh, Congo Brazzaville. And uh, you can have a copy of it, but immediately when they are going to pronounce it, because it was uh, it was the culmination of a one-day event, and they were in the process of uh, discussing over it, uh, because, you know, speech drafting and writing is not easy, and uh, there are so many words that are sensitive, so it takes time. So, unfortunately, interpreters will get a copy of it only to the last minute, most of the time, but this one, we, you don't need that because uh, everything is stored and you have been engaged in the communicative event, so you don't need that. Yes, please. Uh, would using notes interfere with the process of active listening? Would it distract from that? Say it again, uh, The use of notes as references. Would it distract the process of, or interfere with the process of active listening? Thank you very much. This is a very good question, and the answer is in the uh, in this uh, video. You will have an answer. But again, just a very uh, straight uh, answer, I would say yes, if you are not used to. 
but sometimes you don't even have the time and the space on which you write. Sometimes you are taken by surprise, you have no room to get prepared. And here is a very good example. Uh, the other thing uh, is try to visualize, try to get deep into yourself. Uh, notes will help you remember, but will not allow you to get deep into yourself. Exactly like somebody is reading from notes. I don't like to read from notes. If I read or I just sit over there, as a public speaker, not just as an interpreter, this will not allow me to engage more with my audience at an emotional level. I might engage uh, at a physical level, intellectual level, but not at the emotional level. Not at the emotional level. I will not be able just to stress the words like that. Yes, please, gentlemen. Thank you. Please, I have uh, a couple of comments upon what we have uh, just learned in this seminar. The first comment is uh, about the compatibility of uh, the uttered words and the body languages. I think uh, the opposite. We may, uh, we, may uh, we may watch a news uh, broadcaster on the television who's broadcasting uh, sad news and he is laughing, and the opposite. He's uh, broadcasting uh, happy news and he bursts into, into tears. This is my first comment. The second comment is upon uh, you've said, sir, uh, to have a good mood and to meditate, we have to close our eyes and, let's say, make a wish, not to have troubles. An interpreter cannot have or develop a, a, a good mood if he is going to appear before, before a judge in a tribunal. Uh, or uh, he, he has in mind one of his family members who had had an accident. So he, he, he cannot develop a good mood. Thank you for your two questions, despite the fact that we are not uh, done yet with the presentation, but I will be uh, answering very quickly your two questions. The first of them, uh, the possibility of, uh, or uh, we should not rely on body language when the uh, presenter is uh, uh, reporting some very sad news, when he is smiling to the public. Definitely not. There is a situation and environment, and there are some contextual cues you need also to pay careful attention to. Uh, I know that this is uh, for prof professionalism purposes, and or somebody who is uh, just taught to be smiling all the time uh, in a hotel, we do not, we do know. And this is part and parcel of our reading of body language. We know. We know that this is not, not true. And also the other uh, question on uh, meditating, this is for preparation. You need to get ready for your events by engaging into this exercise, which will allow you to be less distracted, less distracted, and to act more confidently and more calmly. This is needed. It's not on the day of the event. This is for the preparation. But also, you brought about another a question related to your own personal problems and how can you uh, address and act and perform uh, your interpreting in that particular painful situation. This is professionalism. You have to act professional. You have to exclude everything. From the time you step in the room, you forget about everything else. It means how to fire your thoughts, good or bad, to keep folks khushua. I will come to you if you have questions about the overall, uh, about this. Yes, please. Sir, I've uh, noticed while uh, watching this video that 
uh, words, uh, lexicon, and uh, the language that you use while interpreting is much more better than the source language of the uh, interpreter interpreted the uh, speech. So uh, the uh, interpreter is required to uh, select his words and uh, uh, select his words to build his uh, his own uh, his own style. Maybe. Thank you very much for the command. Definitely, yes. You, uh, because you are producing another discourse. Because you will be starting from the same starting point, you and the speaker of the original language, which is French in this case. So because he is making a point across to French speakers, and you captured the message and the point, and you would like to relay it not only faithfully, uh, to the uh, Arabs and Arabic community, but also with the same level of uh, quality and the effect of meaning. Because there is no problem of faithfulness here. But if you have the chance to produce a better quality language or discourse without, without uh, being unfaithful to the original uh, message this is what is this is interpreting this is good quality interpreting thank you and the other um, example we are going to watch it very quickly it's how the interpreter is being distracted this is the president of the European Union he is in, uh, on a visit to uh, Italy, uh, to the Ministry of the Interior. So, uh, dear Angelino, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I think that you agree with me that uh, politics is almost always a very tough business. But today, this tough business was Oggi, linked questa with... questa question is talmente important. No, no, si sente. Si, ça va. Je, je, fais, je fais deux phrases, madame, monsieur. Oui. Allora, come, come ci regoliamo? Ah, va bene. Si. Ok. Si. Okay. So, <laughs> I will start again. I, I just said, ladies and gentlemen, and dear Angelino and dear Dimitris, politics is almost always a very, very tough business. Cari uh, amici, caro Angelino, caro Dimitri, quello che io dico sempre è che la politica è un affare molto tosto, molto duro. Today, we had a wonderful experience that politics can also be moving, emotional. And all those, Angelino and Dimitris, who had problems in Europe with relocation, they should have seen for a few moments, for a few seconds, in the eyes of these young ladies and these young men who had now the chance to start a new life. Devo, devo ricordare che spesso la politica è anche accompagnata da momenti di grande emozione, quindi di grande emotività. E Angelino e Dimitri sanno benissimo che coloro che si sono tanto adoperati per assicurare questo programma devono guardare negli occhi delle persone che oggi sono partite e guardando negli occhi di quelle persone, di quei giovani uomini, di quelle giovani donne, si capisce l'importanza di questa iniziativa. To stop a little bit here to throw to you some comments uh, 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 around this interpreted event. So as you can see, the uh, speaker who, who wanted to deliver a very powerful speech with emotions. Have you noticed that? Yes. But then, 
he totally ignored the interpreter. He totally ignored. And the presence of the interpreter has become very annoying. You have notes of that. Uh, I, I will say two sentences and then, and then I will give the floor to you to translate later. And he wanted to get rid of the interpreter. Yeah, and he was laughing. And then first. The second, because if you would like to give a powerful speech in one language, English in this case, and the other end, which is Italian, because the audience is an Italian audience. And you repress your interpreter, then the point will, be, will not be across. You will not make your point across. You will not make your audience feel that you have given a powerful speech. They might see this in your body language, the emotions, but still. And look at here the status of the original speaker and the height and the status of the interpreter. The interpreter, the poor interpreter, has no even space on which she can write her notes. And this is the answer to your question. It is an embarrassing situation. She was distracted by the mic coming from behind. She was distracted by the notes, by two mics. One mic for simultaneous. And then, all of a sudden, a second mic. And then, the notes. A notebook, and then a pen. You see, four objects. How to handle. You have to think of this. And also, this... You see, I have two objects here. I don't have papers. You have to think of it early in advance. This is part of the preparation. As a public speaker or an interpreter, you have to plan for everything quite carefully and meticulously. Don't leave the room for the chance. And also, a powerful interpreter will intervene and makes recommendations about the placement, where he should sit or he will be sitting. This is a protocol issue, yes. But it is your responsibility as an interpreter also to enforce certain things. Where he should be placed in the meeting. Not, uh, uh, not uh, s uh, sitting at the back of people. You have to face the people to see their body language facial expressions. This is one thing. The second thing, like in here. And the, there was a confusion about which mode, consecutive or shishotage or simultaneous. This has to be settled early in advance to avoid the confusion and to avoid the interpreter being distracted. She was distracted. Yes, she is professional. She could cope with it, but to certain extent, because the destruction is very strong. Any question about this? Yes, we will move on. Just you got the gist of the idea. Gentlemen, do you mind if we take your interpreting as a case study? Yes. So, this is a, uh, well, just by way of introducing this um, work and this case study, it's an interpreted event and the talk is inspirational. It is very hard and difficult to translate inspirational and I would like you to observe and he is here to uh, answer and, and reply and report back on his experience uh, to translate and interpret inspirational talks because you are called upon to interpret emotions. Not only words, emotions. And I would like to draw your attention to two things or to ask, you, to ask two questions. Uh, the first, about the professionalism. Yes, the interpreter had the chance to watch the video early in advance and to uh, go over it and, and understand it and then interpret it. But again, despite the professionalism, the accuracy, the quality interpreting, can you compare between the original talk and the interpreted talk in terms of emotions? 
and how inspirational it is. So here, the objective, the purpose is to make, and he started smiling, whether you are rendering an inspirational talk in Arabic. So this is the effect. Okay? So I brought along two friends, Fred and George. Would you like to meet them? هل تودون لقاءهما؟ Fred Flintstone and George Jetson. Fred Flintstone and George Jetson. أحدهما يمثل عالم الماضي، والآخر يمثل عالم المستقبل. لكنهما اليوم لا يمتلئ بصلاة للحاضر. Because in today's world. لأننا في يومنا هذا نستطيع إدارة المشاكل لكن يجب علينا إدارة الناس وقيادتهم لقد تطورنا ولا يمكننا أن نستمر في تسليم الناس بالسياسات والأوامر ولكن يجب علينا قيادتهم باللين والعطف والآن نستحضر حادثة شر ذلك الرجل خارج الطائرة مدمية الوجه صائحا متشبثا بيديه والذي تبين في آخر المقاف أنه طبيب أو لعلكم تتذكر حادثة طرد ذلك المطعم زوجة براد في وسمة زوجة براد بعد 12 سنة من الخدمة الوفية دون تقديم أي تفسير يوم ميلاد براد Or maybe it's the latest incident that has people scratching their heads wherever you live. I will move on to the next case study, and we comment on both of them together. Okay? And the lady is always here, also. You accept? Agree? Approve? Thank you. Shukran lakum. Two years ago, I launched a campaign called Hifshi at the UN in New York. I was very nervous before that speech. The nerves were followed by a tremendous high and immediately after a few days of delay, a flood of hopes, fears, fears. It was the best hope and fears that I could have achieved in one moment. لقد فتحت أبواب الجحيم على مصراعيها إذ تلقيت تزامنا مع ذلك نقدا لاذعا لم أرى مثله من قبل في حياتي وكانت تلك بداية لسلسلة من التهديدات المتواصلة مررت خلال هذين السنتين الماضيتين بأيام من الجام وهذا أقل ما يمكن قوله وأدركت من خلال هذه التجربة الصعبة أن ما أجعله كثير ولكن ما أعلمه أيضا كثير بنفس القدر كانت تلك قصة Ladies and gentlemen, you are now called upon to to comment on the two attempts but first of all, I would like to say, can you uh, use the volume? Uh, to commend the two students for their courage and the, for the great job they have done. So no doubt about that. The job was great. But definitely, I wanted to take these two works and home assignments as a case study to embark in a discussion over the translation of meanings and logic and the translation of emotions, especially in very particular, uh, in a very particular discourse, such as the discourse that claims to be inspirational. And there was the condition set by the instructor that the talks have to be selected on the basis of the uh, the uh, inspirational level, so they have to be inspirational. Why? Because it was a hidden, a hidden end, which is to let students go beyond the words and the discourse and try to dwell in another area, 
which is the area of accessing and reading the emotions through body language and try to relay them in another language. Here, it is a case of simultaneous interpreting and not consecutive. In consecutive, you may act. You have more freedom, like we have seen earlier, even though the camera did not project the interpreter, but still, uh, the interpreter had more freedom and chance to uh, express some of the feelings uh, produced in the room. But here, simultaneous, only voice. And you have to play on the voice, as we have seen earlier. The voice, the pitch, and the intonation, and so on and so forth. So, I would like a comment from you. Don't worry, they will not be upset if you say bad things about their work. They have, got, they have, they have obtained already their very good marks, so don't worry. <laughs> yes, can you please tell us about your experiences? You start or you start? <laughs> okay, ladies first, please. <coughs> it was... It was a very enlightening experience. It, I was uh, nervous. Yes. I, I don't know if you have noticed that. Yes. <laughs> okay. But it was, uh, I was excited at the same time. And, and after uh, finishing the video, I felt that um, I, wanted, I wanted to interpret even um, more videos in a very professional way. So I couldn't really um, get enough of it. It was very enriching and, uh, and uh, I'm so happy that I uh, succeeded, maybe, um, in my first video, so. Great. That's it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Well, for me, it wasn't something uh, very usual to do. I uh, focused on uh, so many things, but uh, the biggest problem for me was the pace of the speaker. He was very uh, uh, speaking in a uh, slow pace, and this isn't in my nature. I speak very fast, I think fast. So this is, was uh, the biggest problem for me. Uh, the other thing that I noticed about the speaker is was, uh, uh, was that he was uh, a kind of a nice guy, and I couldn't. Uh, no, so I'm not talking about li uh, like that. I mean, he was uh, uh, kind of cute, and I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't convey that cuteness uh, between parentheses. And uh, the uh, the other thing that uh, I uh, I learned from that experience is that uh, interpreting is something uh, very challenging and uh, needs a lot of focus. Uh, and uh, it opened for us uh, an opportunity to look for a uh, dream or uh, achieve something. And that's why I said, uh, wha what I can say about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you also for, uh, for raising the issue of mismatch between the pace um, or the speed of the original speaker and the speed of uh, the, the interpreter. This is a matter of character. Some people tend to speak fast, faster than others. And there is another skill in interpreting which is flexibility. You have to adjust your pace to be very flexible, to adjust your pace and your speed and your temper and your mood and your uh, everything, pitch and everything to the original uh, or the source language, text, discourse, and speaker. So this is very important. This is very important. If you normally, by nature, you speak very fast, you have to work on that. If you speak very slow, you have to work on that. Any other question? Ladies and gentlemen. OK, we move on. Two conclusions. By becoming a better listener and a speaker, you will improve your productivity as well as your ability to influence, persuade, negotiate, and more importantly, to interpret. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions on the issues we have raised, highlighted, discussed, shown in the course of this seminar or atelier? Ladies and gentlemen, is everything clear? Clear, clear? Okay, clear. In the security, they use these two terms when they when they preach into uh, or force their way into a room just to engage with the target. So two each time, one has to say okay, and the other one has to say clear, means we engaged. And you know what's mean engage? To engage the target? It is not iqtiham. It's a special word, but a very soft word to say kill. <laughs> kill the target means a man. A kidnapper, for example, or a criminal in a room, you engage with a target. It is being created to say kill. But they don't say kill. How to translate this into Arabic? Engage. Ishtabek, ishtabek ma'a al hadaf. Ishtabek will not express the meaning of kill. It is not. Or, no, it's al qada. Exactly. Al qada. Qada al mubram. Yes, so you need to have a new, uh, the, the, to get into the context, to understand what is being meant by a particular word and why it is being used that way in order not to show the police officers that are the evil guys who can kill. Oh, uh, yes, engage. Like uh, for prisons, they are being called by the prison authorities. They are called correctional facilities. Yes, correctional facilities. And rehabilitation here is here. But correctional facilities. Inmates, rooms, they don't say cells. They say rooms. Rooms, bedroom, five star hotel. So this is for the outside world. Yes, I saw a hand. Yes, I'm coming to you. We do translate room by Ghoraf. Uh, Ghoraf, yes, in Tunisia. Yes, this is for the correctional facility and the prison authorities. But outside, for the outside world, they know them that there is Zanzana. It depends on the discourse. Yeah, I know it's Ghoraf al Ihtifad, but Imshi Tawal TDC, the Truth and Dignity Commission. This is another discourse because it is, it is claiming to be defending the uh, victims of violations. So they will not accept Ghuraf Zilzana. They will call it Zilzana. And they will be having now a fair, ma'arad, an exhibition on, on uh, the life in the prison. It will be, uh, it will be uh, organized very soon in several regions in Tunisia. Yes, please. Sir, shouldn't we then create uh, new terms or coin terms that, are, that have the same effect? Because, uh, for example, friend Niran um, Sadiqa or the example you, you gave um, uh, engage the target uh, is is meant is, is uh, uh, this term is created on purpose because when you hear it you you won't feel guilty you won't say qatalna so if we say uh, what did you say al qada it 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 wouldn't really be a hundred percent faithful or loyal to, to uh, the so what should we Thank you. It, it depends on the discourse, definitely, and the objective behind that. Uh, it, it, we know that this term, engage the target, or the correction of facilities, have been coined to serve, to serve some particular end. If you are translating this to the same, uh, let's say, community, the prison community, then you will be using, for example, ishtibak ma'a al-hadaf, or ishtibak ma'a, uh, you can. 
اور يعني تعمل مؤسسات سجون والاصلاح بتعملها مؤسسه معناتها and you will not allude to uh, the, the, the cells and the solitary uh, confinement uh, yes الحبس الانفرادي الحبس الانفرادي so but if you are um, relaying this to another community, the community of victims, then you need to satisfy the needs of your audience also. They will kill you, sure. Room. Yes, any other question? Yes, please. Um, it's not really a question, but I'm going to talk about the whole seminar. No, I'm not going to look to the camera. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so nervous. So, like, what I felt is like... Yes, that's what I'm going to talk about. Like, always it's the same problem. Like, I have too many thoughts, too many ideas, and I want to I wanna raise my hand and speak about it, but I can't. It's just my, my heart, like, great raises, uh, and I cannot do it. So, the question is, how can we train trust? Or how can we tra train ourselves to speak in public? It's good that this question is coming from a person who is working in music. It is... It is not weird, but it is good. Because speaking in public is challenging by definition. Why? Because you have a level, uh, an amount of adrenaline getting into your body. And this will definitely control, you will be impacted. Your heart, your mind, your mind will be impacted by that amount and you will not be having full control over your hands over your eyes over your voice you will be starting shouting and you don't know why and there is another reason for that because communication between people and this is scientifically proven does not take place between mouth, facial expression, and the ears or the hearts only, but also the hands they communicate with, with one another. The hands, the eyes they communicate with one another. And this is out of the control of the person or the two persons. You have no control over that. When you are in public, when you are in public also, we do have our vulnerabilities. The secret for this, just acknowledge, confirm and value your vulnerability. We are human beings, we are all vulnerable. If we start from there, that we are vulnerable, all of us, we are not dressing quite well as we wish to be dressed, we don't have the nicest uh, eyes, we don't have, and so on and so forth. Just be yourself. Be yourself. And acknowledge your vulnerability. In that community building, that experience with Mark Fish, you know what they, what they, uh, I have been distracted, you see. Because I thought there is something, some call. When you are in a prayer, don't answer any call. Any call. Because the call, when you are in prayer, it will be called from Satan. <laughs> now, I'm coming to you. So, uh, let me dwell more on this idea of vulnerability. So, he grouped together over a fire some people who are homeless in London. Some people who have been subjected to torture, to violence. They have lost everything. And some of them, they have lost their families. And they come from so many countries, 22 nationalities. And over a fire, at a, a freezing London night, the fire, made them form and set a circle. And they have felt the warmth of the fire and the warmth of the community. So how they have started to build the community over the fire. 
And then each one started to, because there was some trust in everyone is coming closer to the other. So they started sharing their stories, painful stories. And what is the common denominator amongst themselves is that all of them are vulnerable. If, and if I know that Schneider, what is your last name? Schneider is very vulnerable, like me. So I don't have any mind to share my vulnerability with her. And she, this will tempt her to share her own vulnerability. So we are equal. We are equal. And this will help the people to be forthcoming and speak. Speaking is not a matter of knowledge that you know the language or you don't know the language. It's not a matter of how well you articulate. No. It's emotional. It's a feeling. Because the psychological factors of fear, shyness, and more particularly here, nervousness and anxiety are the real shields that prevent people from from sharing their minds and their hearts. So, here you need to engage in some discussion in which you acknowledge first your vulnerability. And you start. He is not here, Mabruk. I, I acknowledge. But if the ceiling that you have set is very high, you will be disappointed. You will be frustrated not to attain that very level. Don't speak high. Start low profile. And everything will go. Why? Because if you can overcome the five or ten first minutes, then you are done. Then you... Yes. Please, can you speak now? Um, Please, the camera now. No. Um, well, um, I think like when I'm used to some place or some people, like if I speak in front of my classmates like for twice or uh, I don't know how many times, I'm going to be more comfortable the next time. It's really important. I, I will tell you one secret. I met with my students at 8.30. It's not because I'm not nervous. I wanted to meet with them to get familiar with the space, with the people, to give chance to my vocal cords to be active. Yeah, yeah, today, early in the morning at 8.30, to get ready. And also some people just shout like that before they speak, and some people they will engage into a meditation uh, uh, seance, they call it. Some other people, it depends. I know some people who give lectures, seven lectures on a daily basis on a daily basis. And they still engage their audience. They have the power to do so. Any other question? Yes, please. I want to comment about uh, American, uh, the terminology uh, used by American criminal law. Uh, why uh, do they uh, uh, make use of euphemism? As the Arabic Tunisian proverb says, why, why to name, uh, for instance, uh, room, uh, cell by room? Is it a kind of uh, lying to people or a kind of uh, euphemism? Because you cannot have anyone who uh, argues or uh, pretends uh, to serve an evil cause. Everyone in his discourse or her discourse will be um, presenting himself to the world as serving a, a good cause. And the good cause here is to engage with a target that is evil. The bad guys, the writers they call them. The bad guys. And this is required by, the, by society and the community because these people have held some hostages captive and they need to engage with them. 
So in any discourse, it is a good discourse. That's why they use euphemism. And to call the, uh, the uh, let's say, uh, the kill engage. And they call uh, a cell room. Because it, de it depends on the discourse. It is just a discrepancy between two opposing discourses, two conflicting discourses. Even in Tunisia, we make use of this euphemism. Of course. Yes. Uh, sometimes uh, someone who was cast in, in, uh, into uh, custody, uh, instead of uh, saying, can uh, Yes. Or can fi fil Kuwait? Fil Kuwait. Fil Kuwait. Why Kuwait in particular? You don't know. Or Suisra. Darkhaltu. Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. For example, in war zones and at wartime, um, everyone starts to mention the number of the victims and those who suffered, but they, they never mention the number of people uh, they killed themselves. Because they don't want to feel guilty, they just want to focus on the victims, the, those who were, their families, for example, if they were killed, or, and, I, and I guess it's human nature. That's true. I had an experience in this. I have worked with uh, some people who have served either the British Army or the American Army in war zones, in some war zones in Iraq and in, in, in Afghanistan. And I asked them, and they were uh, just uh, speaking about the cause just to maintain stability in those countries and to defend uh, uh, human rights and so on. But I asked them a very embarrassing question. When we got closer to one another and we uh, have become friends, I asked them, how many people have you killed? How many people? They don't answer this question. They don't. And why? But I learned so many things. Why people in the army, they use tattoos, for example, not like police officers? Because they are expecting the worst when they go in a battlefield. They might be bombarded from above and they will not be recognized. So the tattoo is is a way, like tribes here in Tunisia. Tribes in the past, women and, and, and men, they used to do tattoos. It's a form of belonging to that particular tribe. Yes, it's motivated by identity. And even for the army also. Yes, any other question? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, reiterate my thanks to you for your very nice attention, for coming. Well, I exclude, I spare a little bit my students because they, they, they have to come <laughs> anyway. No, thanks are due to all of you here and for your interactive, uh, uh, for the interactive discussion and for the very high profile discussion that uh, we have engaged in. So I hope we can meet again some other day uh, discussing another subject related to communication, language, translation and interpreting because this area is overlooked in, Ar in the Arab world and in Tunisia in particular and it is my hope, it is my hope that universities, uh, academia and students, uh, they embark on, uh, on a debate over, over those issues. Because if we start debating over those issues, we can solve so many problems related to discourse, even politics, because politics is a matter of discourse, discourse, and, and, and language, and emotions. It's healing, as we have seen. Silence is healing. Some, some, some discourse is healing. Listening is healing. But certain things we barely pay attention to, but they are very 
key. They are vital in our lives. Thank you for your attention. And uh, hope to see you sometime soon. Thank you.